we are clear for launch. This is my review and thoughts on 2016's Hidden Figures. Happy Black History Month. I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie I loved. This video will have very few jokes and I will get into a number of serious topics. I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. I started this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for the subject and also some for the source material and I will be discussing the ending when I get to that part. So, that... Let's get into... And momentarily, okay, here we go. Yes, this is rated, this movie is rated PG, and so will this video be. And yeah, it makes a lot of sense for it to be a PG. This is a story that you can tell to basically people of any age. Even children will be able to appreciate a lot of this, and it doesn't have, like, really, like, objectionable content. Unless you're racist. There are a few issues with it, as far as, it's it's not perfect, as a, you know, it's clearly trying to promote empathy for non-whites, particularly blacks, particularly black women, it does have some issues there, which I will get into over the course of the video. So yes, it was a joke. I'm not saying that you're not allowed. Some people don't like this movie, and they're not racist. Anyway, the plot. This, uh, yeah, I'm to be does a good job here. The story of a team of female African-American mathematicians who served a vital role in NASA during the early years of the U.S. space program. So, let's get into the... So yeah, before I get too much into to details, you know, for, as far as the technical aspects go, the people are very talented. There's a lot of skill and enthusiasm on display here. And let's get into the writing. So the screenplay was written by Alison Schroeder and director Theodore Melfi. And it was based on the book by Margot Lee Shetterly. Now, I'm not... Uh, yeah, so Alison Schroeder, like, other than this... Um, she wrote an episode for 90210, the, the more recent the version of that show. Mean Girls 2, the TV movie sequel. She helped write Frozen 2, which... I mean, that was the... I haven't watched either of those. I, I stopped watching animated Disney. I guess the last one was... Tarzan. Not that there's anything especially wrong with that, just, you know, uh, I am not a Disney adult, you, you know, not that there's anything wrong with that. Oh, and she's writing a Minecraft movie, that's, yeah, I mean, it's popular enough, everything today gets a movie if it's popular enough. Anyway, I hear that Frozen 2 is the lesser of the Frozen movies. Oh, right, she wrote Christopher Robin, I've heard some good about that, but, yeah, um, I'm not sure she's necessarily the the most. Now, Theodore Melfi himself, let's see. So, yeah. Yeah, he's he's one of the directors who writes and directs the, the a, a lot of the yeah, a lot of what he's directed, he's also written or co-written. I am not familiar with anything else he has either written or directed or both. Um, let's see. I um Yeah, yeah. Um 
Now, according to Wikipedia, um, in addition to writing the original book, which came out in 2016 like the movie did, uh, let's see, yeah, um, the, there was a Young Readers edition, released for readers age 8 to 12, and in 2018 there was a, a picture book co-written by Margot Lee Shetterly for children from 4 to 8 years of age to really spark an interest at a young age great thinking and it really is like this is the kind of thing that you know regardless of your age you can you can get behind the the yeah now let's see i think i will put that in the spoiler section real quick so that is yeah, it can go here, fine. There we go. Now, yeah, so sometimes it's a really bad thing for a movie to have more than one writer. You know, they, they struggle to, to have like a coherent, cohesive tone and such. That wasn't really the case here. Honestly, like I went into this movie knowing that it was written by two people. If I didn't... I would probably have guessed that it was just one. And and certainly you can tell that some of the writing was done by the director. The the writing and direction really go hand in hand here. This is not one of those where the director is kind of struggling against the material or it's anything like that. The writing does a, a decent job like a lot of the a lot of the civil rights stuff is basically background. And ultimately, like, that is probably the, the, the way to go for this. Because it is a personal story. It is about these three women. Let me just make sure I get the exact names right. So, Catherine... Uh, uh, Catherine G Gogol. Dorothy Vaughn and Mary Jackson, played by Taraja P. Henson. Octavia Spencer and Janelle Monet, respectively, and because it focuses so much on their, you know, it, it is very much about that because they were able to break barriers, it means that, you know, those barriers were broken and, and it helped a lot of other people as well. But ultimately, the civil rights, a lot of the stuff is just background. I think they did a, a good job, like, you know, if this is the first time you hear about the Civil Rights Movement, this movie is not going to give you more than a very basic understanding, but, f you know, if you show this to a child, there's, there's a pretty good chance they don't know very much about the Civil Rights Movement yet. This is a good starting point. This is, you know... Yeah, if you're eight today, you probably have a smartphone. Uh, so yeah, you know it's a you know you you get some names, you get some dates and facts. You can you can dig further from there, and you know, and it's a it's a great you know if if you are in a situation where like the the parents or legal guardian can help the child along. This is a great thing you can bond over, you know. So, yeah, it. I, th I think they did make the, the right choice. And thankfully, there are movies more specifically about the, the civil rights movement. Now, that brings us to the direction. So, yeah, I am not familiar with the rest of Melfi's work. Most of this I've never even heard of. But the, yeah, he has, he's, he's written nine and directed ten, but of them, a couple of them are shorts, let's see, yeah, he directed four shorts and, and wrote three of the four, so, so yeah, ultimately, let's see, he has written, what is that, five, six, he has written six movies and directed six movies not all of them the same but a lot of them and uh yeah 
Uh, I think he does a, a good job here. There are a couple of very distinct, like, shots that will echo others and shots that echo other movies. There's a The Right Stuff um, reference here, for example. But he doesn't let this kind of stuff, like, completely take over. The movie isn't, like, just constant illusions and, and such. Which... Would be easy, you know. Some some movies about struggles are full of illusions, and I don't think that would have worked as well here. Like the vast majority of what you see in this movie, like a couple of things were invented or adjusted, but most of it did happen and happened fairly similarly to how it's depicted. So you can take it as a as a direct representation, not just or yeah. Reenactment, not just representation. If you want to know what did happen and what didn't, look at the Wikipedia page. I will comment on a few of them at the start of the second thought section. Now, let's see. Right, so yeah, a uh, critic quote. I found this movie's depiction of such clearly bigoted white people and their civil rights era forms of racism, colored bathrooms and coffee pots, that never really digs into the more insidious nature of institutional racism to be problematic. This overtly racist world feels so far removed that it almost makes it seem like racism has been solved, that it's no longer an issue. All you have to do is be exceptional, a once-in-a-lifetime genius, and racism won't be able to stand in your way. It suggests that black people do have to work harder and be superior in an obvious way in order to overcome, and this is never addressed in the movie. Don't be common, no one can help you then, and that is definitely a, a problem with the movie. And I... It wouldn't have been difficult for them to address it. You could have had, like... As it is, there are scenes, you know, this is not a spoiler to say, there are, of course, scenes of racism being challenged. But the people challenging it tend to be these three, like, geniuses. You know, they, they are incredibly gifted. And, yeah, that does kind of tell you, no, you have to be, you know. And I feel like the movie should just have focused on... It starts like that, you know, once someone really gifted has, you know, started breaking down barriers, then people who are, you know, common can start to, to get, you know, because it does feature, for example, relatives and friends of the three women, but it doesn't really show them, like... <sighs> You know, it is perhaps also difficult because it doesn't, um, uh, it, the, the movie, I'm just going to make absolutely sure that I, it, yeah, so the civil rights movement, according to Wikipedia, went from 1954 to 1968, and a lot of this movie is set in 61. So it can't quite show the end of the, you know, which, you know, thankfully the, the movement did end with at least some of the, the, you know, their rights being granted. But I think it would have been good if, you know, if, yeah, if the movie did show some common, and I don't use that as a derogatory, just... Let's be honest, a lot of us are common, you know, I, I'm not holding myself above that. But, yeah, if it showed some of the common black people also being treated better, the, the you know, as, as a result of the, you know, and, and yeah, actually maybe even have some of the people that used to treat black people badly treat the, the, yeah, the, the common black people, uh, well, and there actually is, like, there, there's at least, at least one, one instance in this movie of someone who is basically racist starting to treat one of the geniuses better, but, yeah, that's because they're a genius, you know, that's, so, so, yeah, um, yeah, there's there's this one uh, user review that said, 
Almost every scene is overstated to the point that, as others have said, there is a propaganda f feel to the film. See, I just don't... The moment that you use propaganda, which, let's be honest, is pretty overused. Like, government propaganda is a problem because it lies to people. It gets people to believe in things that hurt other people. But this, you know, the, let's be honest, 2016, that was not exactly a great year for positive race relations. So, you know, it's it's pretty silly to call this government propaganda. Certainly the president at the time didn't like this kind of thing. So, you know, okay, what does it become then? The The propaganda of filmmakers which at that point I, I just feel like it's it's I'm not a fan of calling something propaganda that has such a positive message like even if you want to say oh you know it says that a lot of white people maybe even most white people are racist there are several white people in the movie who make the active choice to stop being racist because they realize that it's wrong, that it's a mistaken idea. And, you know, that's not the only way to fight racism, but it is one of them. But, but yeah, I... Uh, let's see... Yeah, you know, some of the people, thankfully not everyone, who dislikes the movie, but some of them are clearly, actually, you know, yeah, racist. Now, let's see, yeah, I did see some critics, you know, some of them women, some of them African Americans, some of them both, say, I felt seen by this movie. That is great to hear. I feel like that is one of the most important things about the movie. I, I don't, I'm, I'm not particularly interested, as you may have gathered by this point in the video, in, like, dealing with white fragility. Like, that's not, I, I, yeah. If, if you can't handle that there's a movie, you know, there, there are now some movies that are about how African Americans are not lesser than white people, yeah, that's, it's, it's really, that's pretty pathetic. Now, let's see, so, so yeah, the, the movie is basically a, yeah, IMDb listed as a biography drama history movie, and I agree with that. Now, the opening of the movie focuses on the incredible gift of Catherine Gobble, and, you know, that's, I, I think that was a good way to, to do it, although, you know, yeah, the, the fact that she's, we, we see her in a segregated school as uh, you know i uh, let's see i guess like basically still a child basically and she is you know the the teacher hands her the chalk and says why don't you go ahead and finish the why why don't you go ahead and solve the this this equation and i think it is you know the the fact that you have all these other black people looking on in in awe I worry that some people might take away from that that it's unusual for black people to be, you know, really, really intelligent. I think what Melfi, Delphi, no, Melfi, director Melfi, I believe the intent is to convey that black people can be great and need positive, um, crap. Uh, positive um, role models. And, you know, certainly I, I do think a lot of people will understand, you know, have and will understand that from it. Now, I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but 
the ending fits what, with what came before. I think the ending is good, bordering on great. There's no Deus Ex Machina or other convenient writing. Now, the... Yeah, so as an adaptation, I want to start by saying I recommend reading or listening through the original work. Do note that it uses the word, I'm just, I'm going to spell it, not say it, N-E-G-R-O, fairly freely, since it was when and where the stories in are set, and no racists, it's not frequent enough for you to get off on it. But, but yeah, it's a, you know, it's a, it is a very good book. I very much enjoyed it, having it read to me, and yeah, you know, the, the, it really helps provide context for a lot of the stuff in the movie that, yeah, uh, you know, not, not all of the things in the movie necessarily get quite enough context, you know, if you only watch the movie. And ultimately, you know, it is this thing of it is very much a Hollywood movie. It is fairly... It's, it's an accessible movie that you can sit down. You don't need to know very much, you know, to follow. So it's, there is a, a fear of getting too complex and becoming, like, what's the word? Like, difficult to follow for, you know, yeah, for, for a regular audience mainstream audience now so yes um t uh, that brings us to the acting and the characters taraji p henson as katherine gobble a mathematician and she i'm not super familiar with uh, henson from from other stuff but i did already know that she's well respected and yeah she she does a really good job here we we see the the character in a couple of different you know yeah really the 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 trio of main characters we see when we see them when things are going well we see them how they deal with things going badly and you know yeah there's a she is she is gifted but they do also make her relatable like she doesn't talk like a movie genius all the time the there's a lot where she is just like yeah a, a regular person which yeah you know i don't know i can't help but notice that they didn't feel the need to do that kind of thing with russell crowe in a beautiful mind you know he's he does the genius thing throughout and people were just expected to you know, be able to, to keep up, which, you know, that was also a Hollywood movie. It's not like that one came from a completely different system or something, but yeah, it's that thing of there's an expectation that everyone can relate to the a white man, but if, you know, and here, not only it, are, the, are the trio African-American, but they're also women, so you got to be careful not to make it too difficult to, to follow for the regular people. Octavia Spencer as Dorothy Vaughn, also a mathematician. She is not given a lot to do considering her talent, but yeah, you know, she, like, I've, I think it would be completely understandable if she kind of just phoned it in, considering how, how little she's given to work with. She does a really good job. And Janelle Monet as Mary Jackson, mathematician and engineer. I'm going to start with a critic quote. She's an irresistible glittering diamond who effervesces even when she doesn't need to, and I sincerely hope her film offers double now that she's proven how insanely good she is as an actress. I don't think I've seen her in anything else. I uh, I do think she did a fantastic job on the on the album Dirty Computer. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm really glad to see that she's also incredibly talented as an actress. Yeah, I'd like to see her in more. Now, the... Yeah, the... the she's basically the... the 
you know, in a lot of Hollywood movies, you have these sort of smart Alec african-american character and she is basically that but they do also make sure there's a little more going on with her and you know thankfully like it is at least this thing of saying that it's okay to be like that you know there was a while where in hollywood if you wanted your black characters to be taken seriously they had to not come across as black, basically. Kevin Costner plays Al Harrison, director of the Space Task Group, STG. He's in coach mode. He's he's not doing a lot, you know. I don't know why, but for some reason, every so often he just kind of takes a, a role that really doesn't challenge him, you know. But but yeah, he he does what is needed of him. Kirsten Dunst plays Vivian Mitchell, the a, a supervisor, and she's also not given a lot to do. And yeah, it's there's yeah not a lot to, to say. Jim Parsons plays Paul Stafford, head, head engineer in STG. I know that he is on The Big Bang Theory. I've seen clips when people like criticize that show. I haven't watched an episode. I don't intend to ever watch any of that show. Yeah, I feel like they basically put him in this movie because they thought that, you know, he he has a similar energy here to what he does in in the clips I've seen. Like he's he's more socially adjusted here than in the clips I've seen, but yeah, he's kind of, you know, he's he's rude and intellectual and that's that's basically it. You know, I hope that Jim Parsons isn't anything like that in real life. But, you know, yeah, sometimes someone who's actually nice in real life plays a jerk over and over. So, yeah. Mahershala Ali plays Jim Johnson, a military officer. And I gotta say, I've... I mean, he must have taken the role because he saw that here is something that can really improve. You know, it, it's a it's a positive movie for African Americans. He's really given absolutely nothing to do. Uh, that that like, I don't know. I've, uh, actually, was his career had it taken off by 2016? I'm not 100 percent sure. I you know. Uh, I like him in everything I've seen him in. I think he did a... Like, he, he was good even back on the 4400, despite how, like, the the character had that thing of, oh, you know, he's attracted to this woman who looks just like her ancestor, who he was originally in love with. It's Yeah, I don't know why... Some people feel that needs to be in fiction. I don't think it does. Yeah, he's he's good in, in Predators, the Hunger Games movies. Yeah, this was this was the, the same year as Moonlight, so and yeah, and he was on, on Luke Cage at the time. Yeah, if if I I believe his career had taken off by, by this point, so yeah, it's gotta be just that he really felt like this was something that, you know, his, like, he could help raise its profile. But, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it, it didn't need someone of his caliber. But, you know, he's, he's called upon to be charming and have, like, he, he comes across as, like, strong, you know, military officer. So he's... You know, he's not like, oh, he, he kind of Googled a military thing once and now he can't shut up about it. No, no, no. He's, he's got training, he has experience, and he carries himself like someone like that. That's basically what he d d gets to do here. And yeah, you know, dude's charismatic. He's incredibly charismatic. So he, he again, he could do this in his sleep. I appreciate that he didn't just do it in his sleep. 
And I think that is pretty much the... Yeah, that is who I going to but but yeah so you know diversity in casting is one thing it's important for fiction also to try to understand the unique perspective of its minority characters and there definitely are some things here that you know they, they pulled straight from the book some of them that really show it does it is definitely trying to trying to to understand what black people and black women back then had to uh, you know had to deal with and let's see that brings us to the dialogue so there are 28 entries in the imdb quote section all of them are good and yeah the you know each character has like a voice of their own and you can you can clearly tell you know where they're coming from uh, the dialogue is both ri well written and well delivered so that brings us to the cinematography so this was handled by Mandy Walker and she has 41 finished cinematography credits and one coming up. They're making another Snow White movie? Yeah, sure. That's not like the most overexposed story, but anyway. There are good versions of the Snow White story. I intend to talk about one of them in about two weeks. Right. She was the DP on Elvis. So, yeah, she is incredibly talented. And yeah, and she's worked with she she worked with um the the director of Elvis. I can't believe I'm blanking on his name, but I'll have it momentarily. Baz Luhrmann on other occasions. Right, she shot Shattered Glass, which is also filmed quite well and she has some music videos and yeah um she does also have some yeah she shot beastly and red riding hood the the 2011 red riding hood so but you know she's got to eat Sometimes you gotta take a job, but but yeah, she did a very good job shooting this. Let's see. Uh, yes, critic quote. The movie is beautiful to watch in part because of the tremendous work of cinematographer Mandy Walker, who captures the feeling of a time long gone, and it does a good job using just the the basic sort of tools. You know, the, the colors are rich and full as a, you know, there's a, there's a, some sense of, of hope of, you know, things will get better. You know, when the movie, yeah, the movie starts with that one scene that's, you know, I want to say 26 or something like that, 1926, and then it goes to 1961 when all three women are already working at NASA, so... You know the the um, it it would have a very different you know feel and look to it if it started without them already having you know like the the fact that they were working at NASA that was already something that like a lot of people would never have believed could happen and let's. See if yeah it uses framing to you know sometimes a character will be isolated in the framing to underline that you know they are alone sometimes the the framing will yeah it just you know it has the it's it's a it's well shot 
I don't have a lot else to say. That brings us to the editing. And the editing was handled by Peter Teschner, who has 52 credits, including one, oh, uh, three, just last year. And let's see. And as far back as 1983. Now, let's see. Yeah, so in the 80s and 90s, he edited some kind of, you know, B, horror B movies. And let's see. But, yeah. Yeah, still some. Oh, actually, yeah, this kind of looks like it is one of the rare movies he's he's edited that is like yeah i'll i'll just briefly he edited the second legally blonde movie uh scary movie 2 josie and the pussycat so yeah but yeah uh, again the the editing is quite capable and uses the the tools of editing to good effect it doesn't really get, like, super experimental, but that wouldn't really... That would feel out of place for this movie. Now, that brings us to the... There we go. Yes, so the budget was $25 million, estimated... And the gross worldwide was 235 million. So, yeah, um, you might say this was kind of popular. Um, this 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 earned back the money, which, yeah, and yeah, it it does show. You can you can tell from from watching that this was something that they put a lot of money into. The, the talent on display and the, the um, yeah, some of the location shooting and such. And, yeah, uh, this was shot around Georgia. And it gets a lot out of the, the yeah, you know, it, it feels real. It feels... Yeah, it doesn't feel like it was constructed just to to be filmed. And right, the music. So the the music <clears throat> uh hold on. Yeah, so some of the music is by Benjamin Wolfish, some of it is by Hans Zimmer. And Pharrell Williams was also responsible for, uh, yeah. So, let's see. Um, yeah, I have a critic quote. The story itself needs no embellishment to be riveting. Theodore Melfi's direction is straightforward and unflashy, enlivened by a powerful soul original soundtrack by Pharrell Williams that captures the period feel. 100% agreed. Yeah, they, they really do a, a solid job here. This is also, like, you know, if you if you aren't black and you have kids and they don't, they haven't grown up in, like, you know, and, and I, you know, I speak from experience. Um, when I was a child, there were not very many non-white people, you know, where I grew up, so you know, movies are basically where you learn about, you know, African Americans and their culture, for, for some of us, and yeah, this is also a great starting point for, for that kind of thing. You know, the, the yeah, you hear some of the, the music, there's a scene at a, a black church, you know, so, yeah, there's a... Yeah, there, there are scenes that take place in black spaces with a number of black people. 
and yeah it's it's very humanizing it shows them as you know there was that thing years and years ago where bill o'reilly was like shocked that like black people were just like other like like they were normal people they weren't constantly shouting and swearing at each other you know when he went to like uh was, was it like a diner or a restaurant I, I forget but some you know he he ate at a place that had black people and he thought it was the most like he he thought he he just discovered something nobody else had ever heard of when in reality he'd just been ignoring the voices who'd been telling him he was wrong all these years yeah this movie shows them just being normal you know so yeah yeah, the, the the soundtrack might be the the best part of the movie. I'd I'd say it's easily an eight out of ten. And that brings us to the yeah. So pacing wise, there are a couple of parts of the movie where not that much is really happening, but. It never gets outright boring. And yeah. Um I would say if you if you give it the first half hour or so of your time, if you're not interested by then, you know, I, I'm not sure I would really say the movie is really gonna provide anything after that point that's gonna really grab your attention. And the movie is about two hours and seven minutes long, and it doesn't feel like it's way longer or anything. Now, the... Yeah, so I would definitely say the best element of the movie is underlining the presence of black women in STEM, which, you know, you, you see that as... that That's something that you know some some major feminist actors are you know for, for as as a quick example i know natalie portman really cares about you know encouraging girls you know that that it's they can they can actually get into the field of stem if that's something that they they find interesting you know so yeah I would definitely say the worst aspect is that there is too much of a white savior narrative going on. It's too worried about white fragility and, like, I would say the the recent, recent pol you know, politics in America recently have taught us a great many things. And one of them is it doesn't matter how long you have African Americans in movies and TV as just, you know, safe, and they're just, you know, they're non-threatening. You're still gonna have virulent racism. It's not worth it to take baby steps. We gotta, you know, I'm, I'm not part of the the movement. I'm, I'm an ally, but gotta, you know, I, th I think, you know. I think something like Luke Cage, the the Marvel Netflix show, probably did a lot more for black people than something like this. And again, you know, Luke Cage ran, you know, 2016, you know, that, that was one of the years. So they were at the same time, you know, you could, you could watch this in theaters, go home, fire up Netflix and watch an episode of Luke Cage. And I really think Luke Cage is the way to go. You know, not everything has to be exactly like that. But I think that's the kind of thing that does much more to move the needle. Now, yeah, so the worst thing, according to others, is that it's cheesy, which I don't really care that much about. The thing I was most worried about was that this would be very much a Hollywood version of STEM, and I would definitely say that the movie, it does simplify some things in a, in a frustrating way. The thing I was most looking forward to was an inspiring story, and the movie delivered pretty well on that. 
Now, the both of the trailers, the, the teaser and the full trailer, both give too much away. I think maybe it would have been difficult to get audience interest without spoiling. And certainly, if you like the trailers, you're more likely to like the movie. And I would say the, the trailers are worth watching. The cover and posters don't give too much away and give you a decent idea of what the movie is like. And that brings us to Rotten Tomatoes, where it has a 93%, making it certified fresh based on 324 reviews, only 22 of them negative and a 93% audience score based on over 50,000 ratings, and the average rating is 4.4 out of 5. And on Metacritic, it has a 74 out of 100 from critics. Based on 47 reviews, 38 of them positive, 9 mixed, no negative ones. And the audience score is 7.5 out of 10, based on 407 ratings. 328 of them are positive, 46 are mixed, 33 are negative. And I am, let's see. And... Let's see. Yeah. That brings us to IMDb has 594 IMDb user reviews, 456 of them without spoilers. And I read the top 100 of the spoiler free ones and the votes by users on them. Yeah, so of the of those 100, only five of them gave it a 1 out of 10, three gave it a 2 out of 10, three gave it a 3 out of 10, three gave it a 4 out of 10, four gave it a 5, seven gave it a 6, 16 gave it a 7, 25 gave it an 8, 19 gave it a 9, and 15 gave it a 10. So yeah, very well received. And... 36.5% gave it an 86. Oh, right. And yeah, the overall, um, yeah, it has a 7.8 out of 10. 36.5 voted 8. 21.4 voted 7. 18.5, 9. 14.4, 10. 5.76, 1.65, 0.81. 0 0.6, 4, 0 0.3, 3, and 0 0.2, 2. So, yeah, very well received by critics and viewers alike. Now, given that this is about the, you know, space, the, these, yeah, manned space missions, it does, of course, have some special effects. And I would definitely say they are very close to being photorealistic the you know that is perhaps you know the the amount of of money you know there are movies from 2016 that have photorealistic effects you know so it is ultimately that yeah they probably didn't quite have enough money maybe not quite enough time but they are very close to being photorealistic and, and convincing. And certainly, like, with this kind of thing, you know, the effects are supposed to help make it convincing that this, you know, it did actually happen, the, the space stuff, but they didn't have cameras out in space that filmed it for, you know, HD, the, the you know... So, so that it would look great on the, the, uh, what's the word? In a, in a big budget movie. So they have to do that stuff with special effects. And if the special effects don't work, then you're basically bored during those scenes because you're like, that's not real, that's clearly not real. 
and they come close enough that the those scenes get to you. Now, let's see. Um, yes, so there will be, uh, right now it's looking like three links in the um, description box, that's it. And let's see. So yes, I rate this eight black women in STEM out of 10. And honestly, like, I'm not sure I would watch it again, like, today, but, like, I could watch it again in a week, you know. I, yeah. It does what it means to, and it does it pretty well. It's never, yeah. It's never less than compelling. And that brings us to the spoiler section. So, starting with notes taken while watching. So from here on out, spoilers for both the movie and the book. So, let's see. So, so yeah, you know, I appreciate that several of the black characters in this movie... You know, they don't have to tone down their personality or culture. And, you know, so yeah, at the start of the movie, uh, you know, they, they joke about you'd have to sit in the back of the bus if you're not going to drive there in a, in a car. And, you know, later, you know, we see some of them sitting in, in, the, black, in the back of the bus. So, you know, that joke is basically, you know, they're, they're trying to deal with the, the, some harsh realities by making jokes about them instead of, you know, like pretending they don't exist or something. I appreciate how tense the the scene with the cop is and the relief of the, you know, they even get an uh, escort. You know, that's actually, the, the, you know, one of the first scenes and one of the last scenes are, are tense. And there is some tension also when, you know, scenes of, of these black women moving in spaces usually reserved for white men and yeah so even in his intro um i hold on i forgot his name um paul is already kind of a jerk and you know like okay he's he's smart but he's you know i i suppose you could say he he doesn't He can, he can understand a lot, but he's not actually, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't follow it through to, to the point where he, you know, because he's introduced saying, I don't think the Russians are going to be dropping nukes just because they got, which, you know, yeah, at the time, people were very, very scared of the, you know, I feel like, don't we know by now that the, the whole, the, the space race was actually Russia covering up for how bad the economy was going? I, I forget. At, at some point, certainly, their, their economy was, was going badly. But at this point in time, people were, were terrified, you know, and they do even mention the, the you know, Catherine's three daughters talk about the, the uh, duck and cover, you know. And... Yeah, we're told, you know, I gotta have the names in front of me, otherwise I'm not gonna... Um, Dorothy. We're told that Dorothy is unlikely to become a supervisor, which, of course, makes it satisfying later when she does become one. And the the heel gets caught on the, you know, and the and the 
Polish, uh, you know, he, he's like, no shoe is worth dying for. Did they say... Yeah, I think they, they did say that that was part of the uniform, that the women had to wear heels. You know, certainly it is, like, I, I can't help but wonder if some people took it as one of those misogynistic jokes about women wearing heels to everything that wasn't, like, women didn't make the decision to wear impractical footwear. They were pressured to. Anyway, now the, let's see. Uh -huh. Right, and the, the, um, yeah, we see that Catherine is a great mother. You know, the the oldest of the of the three daughters has to do chores, and in return, she earns that she sleeps in her own bed. And yeah, let's see. Yeah, the, the, you know, I appreciate that it went by quickly because I think it would have been exhausting if the movie took forever on Catherine proving she's not a spy. But, you know, yeah, that is something that would have happened if you knew a lot back then. And, yeah, I, I noted that it humanizes the trio, but not really the racists very much. You know, if if you have a positive opinion of Kirsten Dunst or Jim Parsons, these various, you know, it's most likely because of some other, you know, something else you've seen them in that's carrying over to here, rather than... You know, like, like if if you've watched this and not, like, the, the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy, you probably wouldn't believe that Kirsten Dunst has played, like, the love interest of, you know, a number of movies. Because she's really unpleasant here. And, you know, some critics have really... Uh, user reviews, some user reviews have really taken issue with this... I mean, at the end of the day, it's it's just, it's movie shorthand. If you humanize everyone, then the audience, like, the the, the idea is the audience won't know who to, to root for. So, look, you know, let's say that you, that they also humanized at least one of the racists. Well, then, when there's a confrontation, we don't know, you know, yeah. So, that's that's basically why... But of course, racists think that it's like criminal when it happens to make, you know, non-whites look good. And yeah, you know, we see Dorothy go to the, you know, the, um, the whites section of the library pointing out, I need this book and they don't have it in the color section. And she gets kicked out, but she did grab the book pointing out. I pay taxes, to, you know, everything in that library is paid for with taxes. And, you know, she sits uh, on the back of the bus. In the bus, or whatever, yeah, you know what I mean. With the, with the kids. And I appreciate that, you know, when Jim... Hold on. Yes, when Jim dances with, with Catherine... You know, he, you know, she allows him to apologize, but she's not just taking, you know, the fact that he's interested in her does not make her, like, you know, she, she knows that she deserves to be where she is. And he came across as very, you know, he didn't mean to be condescending, but that is the, the effect and, yeah, you know, apology is in order. He apologizes. And, uh, you know, let's see. I think she does, you know, she says, mm, it's, it's an okay apology, kind of. You know, she does basically accept it. 
I really appreciate, uh, you know, Dorothy points out once the once the IBM come in, you know, we're going to be out of a job unless we know how to program that thing. Then we'll be, you know, and and as the the end credits bit said, you know, yeah, they they did keep working on that, and you know. Yeah, it was extremely important. Like the the space missions would not have the the yeah, America would never have put a man on the moon without a lot of computations and yeah. Let's see. And the each of the all three members of the trio get to deliver at least one strong speech which you know, popular in, in Hollywood movies, and they are, you know, they're, they're pretty well written and, and delivered here. And, you know, you won't be surprised to hear, I'm, I've, I forget if all three of them, but at least one of them was like, decide, just did not happen, but, you know, they play well in movies. And, you know, I, I, I can't imitate his, his cadence, but, you know, the, the, and now I can't even remember his name, but the president at the time says, you know, we can't let the Russians get to the moon first, because if they plant their free, that'll be bad. We intend to plant a banner of freedom and peace. So does anyone have one of those? And the, the, you know, we see on TV MLK and one of the, um, what's it called? One of one of the the buses was attacked and yeah, and you know, um, oh right, I forgot to call him. I I do think Aldous Hodge does a good job as as Levi Jackson, but but yeah, you know, he points out no, the kids should see this. You know, they should know the world we live in. And, yeah, the, the, you know, Mary approaching the bench and talking to the judge and saying, you know, making, you know, she did some research on him and she's talking about firsts and, yeah, good speech, you know, didn't happen, but I, you know, yeah, yeah, the, the thing with the movie, is, with this kind of movie is that kind of speech can really help inspire someone which, you know, the the reality, let's see, I think she just, like, she asked and then they let her. You know, she didn't have to talk anyone into it. But the speech is gonna, you know, hit harder. So, let's see, and... Yeah, and, and Dorothy gets the, the IBM to work. And... Let's see... Yeah, and and the um, let's see. Yeah, Catherine. You know the 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 chalk is handed over to her like at the start of the film, and she does solve the equation. And Dorothy is able to bring the the girls, her girls into the the IBM room because she made sure that they you know they were able to to program this thing and let's see yeah and and Mary does get support from Levi which is great and I that that is one thing I do really appreciate that, you know, I get that by 2016, it would have been pretty ridiculous not to. But I appreciate that it's saying, you know, they faced, you know, not not only did they face it, you know, they, they faced discrimination for being African-American. They also faced misogynist, you know, that that kind of discrimination. And. Yeah, like the the you know the first time Jim hears that Catherine is doing what she's doing, he can can you know, like he 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 believes her, but he does manage to you know 
put his foot in it and and say something that sounds condescending. And the same, you know, L Levi doesn't. Let's see. I think with Levi, it's that he doesn't. He thinks it's unrealistic for Mary to to get, uh, you know, to to where she intends to to get to the the engineering, thing, you know. And once he sees that she's being allowed to to go to these night classes, yeah, the the uh, what's the word? That you know, he is he is supportive of her. And I will grant, uh, you know, we've seen a million of these, but the proposal scene is is kind of sweet. And yeah, you know, the it's it's kind of wild seeing the 1960s. You know, this was before money and politics, back when there was technological process progress. You know, so yeah. And. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, and, and it is really cool that, that Catherine, you know, that, that John Glenn asked Catherine to check the numbers, which did apparently happen in real life. It's just, in real life, she had, like, three days to do it, where in the movie, it's this very Hollywood, you know, final rush for a deadline kind of thing. Let's see. It's, it's wild how many... Hollywood movies have that kind of thing, especially in these, like, you know, based on a true story stories where they very frequently didn't actually happen like that, you know, but yeah, I, I, I suppose like a deadline is the kind of thing that even a child could relate to. So maybe that's, uh, you know, yeah, what with school and not whatnot. And Dorothy does finally become a supervisor and very tense ending with the problems with the heat shield. And I think that is what I had for this section. So yes, that brings us to the final section notes taken before watching so this is yeah um, the the book mentions that at least one thing done to ease tensions between whites and blacks backfired big time and let's see yeah so Wikipedia, the Space Task Group was led by Robert Gilruth, not the fictional character Al Harrison, who was created to simplify a more complex management structure, which is necessary for the film. I don't know why they didn't just, you you know, yeah, um, call the character Robert Gilruth, but, you know, simplifying the complex management stru structure was definitely necessary. And... Let's see, the, uh, yeah, so the scene where Harrison smashes the colored ladies' room sign never happened, as in real life, Catherine Johnson, for her part, was initially unaware that the bathrooms at Langley were segregated in both its east and west areas during the Naka area, and used the whites-only bathrooms. Many weren't explicitly so labeled for years before anyone complained. She ignored the complaint, and the issue was dropped. Johnson refused to walk the extra distance to use the colored bathroom, and in her words, just went to the white one. It's great that that worked for her. But there are countless cases during Jim Crow era where that didn't work. And I think they were scared that people would think the norm was what happened in this one instance if they put it in the film. I think they made the right choice. I, I think until race relations are much, much better in America, it's necessary to show... Because they were. There was the segregation. It just didn't... Like, nobody really enforced it on, on her. You know, but technically there were colored and white bathrooms in, you know, so, so yeah, anyway. Um, and yeah, so Theodore Melfi said there needs to be white people who do the right thing. There needs to be black people who do the right thing and someone does the right thing. And so who cares who does the right thing as long as the right thing is achieved I've 
read that quote over a number of times. I it feels very rambly to me. I'm not entirely sure. I, I okay. So the gist of it is basically he thinks that it is necessary to to depict white people doing the right thing. Dexter Thomas of Vice News criticized Melfi's additions as creating the white savior trope. In this case, it means that a white person doesn't have to think about the possibility that were they around in the 1960s South, they might have been one of the bad ones. The Atlantic's Megan Garber said the film's narrative trajectory involved thematic elements of the white savior. Melfi said he found hurtful the accusations of a white savior storyline, saying, It was very upsetting to me because I'm at a place where I've lived my life colorless. I grew up in Brooklyn. I walked to school with people of all shapes, sizes, and colors. That's how I've lived my life, so it's very upsetting that we still have to have this conversation. I get upset when I hear black film and so does Taraji P. Henson. It's just a film. If we keep labeling something a black film or a white film, basically it's modern day segregations. Segregation. We're all humans. Any human can tell a human story. I don't want to have this conversation about black or white film anymore. I want to have conversations about film. The Huffington Post's Zeba Blaze said of Melfi's frustration. His frustration is also a perfect example of how, when it comes to open dialogue about depictions of people of color on screen, it behooves white people, especially those who position themselves as allies, to listen. The inclusion of the bathroom scene doesn't me make Melfi a bad filmmaker or a bad person or a racist, but a suggestion that a feel-good scene like that was needed for the market marketability and overall appeal of the film speaks to the fact that Hollywood at large still has a long way to go in telling black stories, no matter how many strides have been made. Let's see, and the scene where a coffee pot, coffee pot lab labeled colored appears in Katherine Johnson's workplace did not happen in real life and the book on which the film is based depicts no such incident that's true but black people were kept out of white diners IRL so it's a logical invention for the film Johnson gained access to editorial meetings as of 1958 simply through persistence not because one particular meeting was critical Short of a tone-breaking, Aronofsky-style hip-hop montage, how would you make it visually appealing that she persistently asks? So, again, I think that was the right way to do it. Author Margaret Lee Scheller... Shetterly has agreed that there are differences between her book and the movie, but found that to be understandable. For better or for worse, there's history, there's the book, and then there's the movie. Timelines had to be conflated, and there were composite characters, and for most people who've seen the movie, have already taken that as the literal fact. You might get the indication in the movie that these were the only people doing those jobs, when in reality we know they worked in teams, and those teams had other teams. There were, so, there were sections, branches, divisions, and they all went up to a director. There were so many people required to make this happen. It would be great for people to understand that there were so many more people, even though Katherine Johnson in this role was a hero. There were so many others that were required to do other kinds of tests and checks to make Glenn's mission come to fruition, but I understand you can't make a movie with 300 characters. It is simply not possible. Her acceptance is much more important than that of racists who jump on the tiniest little inaccuracy and say that the movie's terrible or shouldn't have been made. I've read that Katherine Johnson was surprised that someone would make a movie about her life, but I haven't been able to find the full quote, so I, I can't really respond. I don't know exactly why she felt that way. I'm not going to lie. If I knew anyone who had lived through the events of her life, I would definitely want a movie made out of it, especially now when racism in America is at its worst it's been in decades. Because, see, I, you know, I, I did see some people say that, you know, some, some people who thought that the movie was racist against whites that the the movie you know oh if she if the real Katherine johnson said she didn't understand why a movie you know yeah so surprised that someone would make a movie about her life honestly yeah so i i don't no i'm not gonna theorize i'm just saying i don't think that means that necessarily like i know you know she's she's like um, let's see, I'll, I'll find real quick, oh, there we go, so the real Katherine Johnson, right, um, R.I.P., she died 2020, so after the movie came out, so, so yeah, she was 98 when the movie came out, you know, there are some elderly people who have had fascinating lives who don't themselves think that movies should be made of their lives. That doesn't mean, 
you know, like, I, I think it's important to remember she wasn't, like, offended about it. She wasn't the, the, um, I have the, um, I have the quote right around here. So, let's see. Um... After the film was screened for Johnson, she expressed her genuine approval of Henson's portrayal, but wondered why anyone, anybody would want to make a film about her life. That's not the same thing as her thinking that the movie shouldn't exist. You know, so just to, to clear that up for the... Yeah. Now... The, let's see. But, but yeah, I would definitely say, you know, as I said in the review section itself... I do recommend the the book. It does really help provide context for the you know the the book doesn't as far as I can tell is basically a completely accurate uh, account. I don't think the the book itself invents anything, you know, but with a book you can actually explain this kind of thing where if you actually see the the kind of thing that's you know, some, some of what's in the book, if you tried to put that to a movie, I mean, I guess if you were making a miniseries, maybe, but you can't get it in, in under two hours. And it's interesting, for all the, the things that were, were, you know, whitewashed, according to IMDb Goofs, while the film does depict some of the problems faced by the African-American female protagonist, for the most part, the attitudes displayed by the majority of the men at the Space Center reflect 21st century mindsets rather than those of the early 1960s. Virginia was still a southern state, so the women would have had to endure numerous difficulties related to both their race and their gender. And, right, I have some critic quotes. Yes, the movie is idolized in its portrait of women who have undoubtedly been denied very ordinary human flaws and failings, but then so what? They're heroes, every one of them. Yes. And, let's see. Um, yeah, so, you know, the... the yeah, some some conservatives have said that you know oh the you know the the trio of women lack flaws. The, there's no proper you know yeah there's there's not enough development for them and this kind of thing. Lots of conservative heroes lack flaws. A lot of the characters played by Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone have struggles. Yes, but they don't really have character flaws. And conservatives and myself, I'm, but I'm. Oh. I'm not saying that all or ma all main or major characters need to have character flaws. There are other ways to make them interesting. Still love these. You know, don't don't get me wrong. There's a lot of the the body of work of Stallone and Schwarzenegger that I really love. And for a lot of ists and phobes, if the minority characters have any flaws, the ists and phobes will think all minority members have those flaws. Instead of making it, instead of that making them think of them as individuals, obviously in the in real life, everyone has flaws. But you know, African Americans have had to basically be perfect, be much better than white people in order to be treated with any kind of humanity. Now, let's see. Um, right, and the, yeah, so there's this. Um, yeah, so, so one, one conservative says, I get that women and minority women in particular need to feel better about themselves, but self-esteem should stem from actual real-life accomplishments this is material so typical of ethos of the millennial generation. You should feel good about yourself just because no actual merit required. I guess he missed the part where they were... Like, even if you don't believe that... Like, yeah, there are things that happen in this movie that didn't happen in real life. But they were still incredibly important parts of this. Like, they didn't... Like, this is not like taking a story where white people accomplish something and inserting black people into it. There were black people, black women, working at NASA with these kinds of things at the time. 
Now, let's see. And... Okay, and so, yeah, so the, this is another user route. Although it was sometimes talked about, no character apart from the main two actually do any math or any programming. I, just because you don't see it, like you, you constantly, you're seeing them, like what do you think the, the you know, the folders of papers being handed to Catherine for her to check do you not realize that that must mean that someone else, presumably a white guy, since she's the only, you know, that, you know, she's checking someone else's math. She's, like, that. that is specifically telling us that a lot of math is being, like, yeah, some people just don't, yeah, anyway, let's see, and... Yeah, you know, the, the, basically, this is Hollywood movie shorthand, you know, if you, if you only see one character doing a lot, then, you know, you're, you know, what, obviously, part of that is going to be that the, you know, you, you realize from that, okay, what this person is doing is really important. It doesn't mean that nobody else is doing important things. It does basically imply that that is perhaps the most important. And I just, I wish I saw the racist be as angry about this when it makes white straight Americans look good to the detriment of others instead of just whining when it makes non-whites look good. You know, just off the top of my head, I, like, when, when the movie, um, crap, what was it, called? okay, I know who directed it, so I'll go off that, Argo, that's it, when Argo came out, like, you had a number of people pointing out, the movie makes it look like Americans were the only heroes in the situation, and, like, if it were, like, it basically... Let's see, I've, if I recall, I've, I've only watched the movie once, but isn't there, like, a scene where, like, a British, you know, like, like, um, uh, yeah, so like, British uh, authority says, oh, you, you can't have them here, when in reality, they did, actually, like, the, it wouldn't have worked without the Americans, but it wouldn't have worked if the Americans were the only ones either. And at that time, I distinctly remember hearing, you know, conservative Americans saying, ah, it's just a movie, stop taking it so seriously, when that's actually the kind of thing that reinforces, like, I've never gone to school in America, something for which I'm forever, eternally grateful. I have heard about the kinds of things they teach and the kinds of things they definitely don't teach. If you if you base your idea of what like world history is like, if you base it on only what you learn in American school and what conservative filmmakers put in movies, you're not going to understand how important the rest of the world is to a lot of historical events and the, the it, it, you know among other things it can encourage isolationism it can make americans think that without working with the rest of the world america will get by just fine which is just demonstrably not true you know and that's that's a huge problem these days you know trump went out and actually said what a lot of his base were already thinking that america should be more isolationist and he managed, you know, because so many were convinced of it, he got into power and he used some of that power to alienate a number of countries. And it has made things worse for those countries and for America. You know, we do need to 
challenge this idea. So just, yeah. Once, you know, schools actually teach accurate history, then we can start dealing with this kind of thing. Otherwise, I think the this kind of movie shorthand is only bad when it makes people think that, you know, for example, white Americans solved everything without anybody else's help. And, right, one more critic quote. The rise, the breakthrough, the challenge at the end, the fall, and then the final ascension to praise are all tried and true inspirational feel-good biopic cliches. Very true. And I think the movie does a good job with them. And... Yes, so that's the end of the video. Hit me up in the comments. Let me know what is your favorite movie that underlines how important black people have been to America prospering. Pro prospering? Pro yeah. And if you like the video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie. And recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.